We're going to do a lot of turning today, so uh, I hope that you will uh, try to keep up with us, and there's a lot to talk about. This is a big subject. I'm going to try to cover the whole thing as I think it should be covered in 45 minutes or so. It's impossible to do, but we're going to try to give you some highlights and overviews. Uh, I do have some uh, of these sheets that I brought. If you want them that have the scriptures on them, you can check them for yourself. Uh, turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you will. We'll start there. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I had some kids asking me at camp about aliens. Everybody's talking about giving up on planet Earth because they don't think they're going to be able to save it. <laughs> and they're already headed towards Mars. You know, they're going to go out there and see what they can find. <laughs> I told this one young man, uh, I said, there's nobody out there. He looked at me, and <laughs> he didn't believe it. I said, no, there's nobody out there. I said, none that you can see anyway. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and look at verse 1 and 2. Verse 1, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Three times in your Bible... Statement is made about don't mess with my word. God's word is equal to himself, and he means that. And when he says this right here, he says the same thing over in Proverbs 30, and he says the same thing in Revelation 22, and you can look those up and see it. In the, in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, God says, do not mess with my book. Those are three important warnings for everybody that messes with God's book. And when you do that, you're, you're in danger for you as a saved person you're in danger of a problem that could occur for you at the judgment seat of Christ. Because part of your service is not to correct, condemn, or criticize God's word, and especially not to corrupt it. Okay? So that's really important. You don't mess with the word of God. Satan does those things. That's his job. Uh, Eve did that a little bit, kind of innocently in, in some, to some degree. She started adding to it. Right after that, Satan comes out and flat out lies about it to her. And she was deceived. And so uh, we're in the mess we're in because somebody did not believe God's word. And they messed with it. So that's just the kind of the, the, the thing we should think about. Uh, you, you understand that these things, uh, turn over to Romans chapter 4, these things are important enough for us to know where the Bible is. Finding those words of God have really been the dilemma of Christendom. They, they will tell you that the Bible is plenary, it's verbally inspired, and there it is. We believe that. Plenary, verbal, inspiration, they believe it. The problem with it is they don't tell you where to find the words because they don't understand the concept of preservation. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. The idea of inspiration uh, is God's idea. It's the manifest way that he puts his words onto the paper through human authors. And uh, there are some fantastic verses, and there's so many that I had to just take a sampling because there's, just, there's too many of them. Uh, I, I really enjoyed going through and studying this and, uh, and revisiting some of these things, and it just it brought to my mind all the things um, really that I had uh, learned over the years, especially through GSB. I, I went to uh, Orlando, Florida in 1984 with my pregnant wife and uh, my little truck, and I went up there to see, did our God-breathed Bible expire? And Brother Rick uh, has been talking about this, and I, and I heard J uh, John Beckemeyer said great things about this series, and they had just... Uh, the year before, talked about it, and Richard spoke on it in Atlanta. And he came to Orlando that spring and taught it. I took my wife up there, and we sat, and we listened to that. 
And we saw all the guys from the school that came with Richard that year sitting on the front row. We saw all their heads. There they were, just like you see in the videos. <laughs> and they're all there. They made the trip to Florida. And uh, I, I remember that time. And, you know, I, I, got, I, I came away from that with I knew God's word, that my Bible was God's word, but I didn't know how to explain that to anybody. I didn't know anything about manuscript. I didn't even know what a manuscript was. I didn't know the difference between a manuscript and a text. I didn't know a majuscule from a whatever. You know, I mean, it's one of those things you... You don't know because it's not something that's taught. And when I started in the school and began to work through those things, I, I got real excited about the fact that not only do I have the Word of God, but now it's documented and proven and, and it's clean and clear. It's not, it's not something that's ambiguous or, or strange. Uh, I wanted to read this to you about this because I thought this was pretty good. I took this out of my class notes. This is July 22, 1986. The four main views of the Bible. The first view of the Bible is the Roman Catholic view. Holy Mother Church and tradition determines what Scripture says. They're above Scripture. That's what they think. The liberal view is that the Bible is full of myths and legends, and it's usually about Jonah or Moses parting the Red Sea. Can't happen. Never happened. Okay? All that stuff. No, no. That's legends. Common view of the man on the street. The new view, the neo-Orthodox view, is the Bible is super history. It's above history. This view denies the historical content and, you know, uh, Brother Brian Ross has been doing quite a bit of historical tracking on what's happened since the Apostle Paul till now. And it's been fantastic to see that the grace message is not a, a period of little, uh, uh, little periods of, of, of high spots where their truth might have flourished for a little bit like a flower does in, a, in your yard. No, it, it's a continuous chain all the way through. Preservation is a big, giant chain with big links. It's never going to break. God's word has to be preserved. And, and that's because there is no reason to inspire the word and reveal the word to mankind and not preserve it. That's idiocy. That's not even logical. And so that neo-Orthodox view is what it is. Now, the conservative fundamentalist view is the view you're going to find in virtually almost every doctrinal statement that you pick up. One of the great defects in a doctrinal statement is that statement that it's found in the original writings, which nobody's ever seen. Nobody knows where they are today because they're not here. They're gone. If you had a love letter from your wife that meant more to you than anything else and you didn't want it lost, what should you do with it? Make 100 copies and send it to all your friends and family because somebody's going to hang on to it for you, okay? Even if you're like me, you put it down and walk into the room and go, where did that go? You know, that's what happens. You know, you, you get old and it begins to, it's hard. And you start losing it, you know. And, uh, but the nice thing about that is every spring I can hide my own Easter eggs. It's okay. <laughs> if you feel that way, just welcome to the club. The conservative view presents the Bible in, in this, with this in mind. They say all the fundamentals of the faith are present in the Bible in spite of the mistakes that are said to be in the translation. I have a rule in my church. If you start talking like that around my people, there's the door. Just leave, okay? And then when you calm down and quit saying things like that, you can come back and we'll go through this. But I don't want, I don't want my children and I don't want uh, the children in our group or any of the young people that are coming in or newly saved people to hear anybody talking like that. Amen. If you've got any control at all from your pulpit, you better use it, okay, to protect your people because they're going to come in and try to do that. And they're already doing it. All four of these views share a common belief. And that is that they do not possess the entire word of God. Now, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, even an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, you know, Baptist who's smart enough to get out of the Southern Baptist into an independent Baptist, so they use the KJV, he still says the same thing. Now, a lot of them are where we are on this, and, and I think a lot of us are there because of where they've been for a long time on it. Some of them have been in this a long time. But they'll say, you know, that the Bible contains the Word of God, and... They do not believe that it is even possible to find God's word anywhere. 
And I can tell you, I've had quite a few guys that uh, I, <laughs> I knew in the early days that I read after, and I, I really appreciated their ministries, and I looked up to them, and they, they said exactly the same thing. <coughs> the word is settled in heaven forever, but you've got to hunt for it in, with tools down here. Well, I can tell you this. If you, if you get a modern Bible and you begin to study it, you're going to need some tools. I suggest a book of matches would be a good thing to start with <laughs> after you read it. Have a weenie roast. But I can say that there is a positive side to this. This is a very positive thing. So I want you to think about this for a second and think about God's word about, and how God works. All of these lights in this room are shining down so you can see your Bible. All of these modern versions do exactly the same thing. They point the way to the right one. Without those, we would have trouble. It wouldn't be as easy because, of course, it probably wouldn't need to be. But, but the idea is that when you have all these Bibles and, and you need a spotlight to shine on where the real Bible is, they'll do it every time. They are missing thousands and thousands of correct renderings, meaning the changes. They're, they're just missing. They've just been retranslated. Thousands and thousands. They're missing hundreds and hundreds of verses. Two, three hundred, easily. I have a list at home that we compiled at Suncoast, and it's that thick in a notebook, of the five top-selling Bibles in the United States. And every word from Matthew 1.1 1, 1 to the end of the book of Revelation, every single verse, went, was gone, we went through it. And we not only showed the, those verses that are omitted, but we showed those verses that are partially omitted and those words that are partially omitted, uh, that are just out of the verse. When you go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, and it says that, you know, well, let's just turn there. I'll just show it to you. Uh, this is... Um, I'm studying through the book of Colossians right now and teaching it, and uh, this verse has always been a big deal. I, I, to me, I think it's one of the most beautiful verses, and I, I love the fact that I got it twice in my Bible. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and it's here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. And I had a conversation with a man about this thing, and he said uh, in verse 14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, there's only three times in Paul's epistles that redemption by blood is mentioned. It's here, Romans 3, 25, 24, and 25, and Ephesians 1, 7. Those three spots give you something to use when you want to talk about the blood. In Evangelism Explosion back in the late 70s, when uh, I was in a small group of about 9 or 10 people, they, we, they got into Evangelism Explosion from uh, D. James Kennedy down in Coral Gables, and I, I, I bought two of those books. I thought, man, I'm going to learn how to go out and win souls. I got into the ministry, I got in, involved in the Word of God by not being able to, 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 to correctly give the gospel to some Catholic girls that were wanting to know about, more about the Bible, and they were asking me questions, and I didn't have them. I felt uh, this was the dumbest thing. I've been saved since I was in the first grade. I, I didn't understand. I'm giving them the gospel. That's all I had. And so I told my dad about it, and he says, well, maybe we should sit down and look at some of these things and start studying. That was the beginning for me. And this whole idea of taking verses out of the Bible is satanic. It's part of the satanic policy of evil against God's word. And uh, in verse 14, that verse is missing in almost all the modern versions. And I had a man talk to me about that. He says, well, it's over in Ephesians 1, 7, and that's the companion book. So if it's over there, what's, the wrong, what's wrong with it? Not being here, I said, the fact that it's over there and it's a companion book of Colossians, or com the other way around, maybe, I said, that's the reason it should be there. I would determine if it was not there that it should be because, you know, it's there. They just don't use the correct text to get it. If it's not in the text, it's not going to make it into the translation because that's, that's easily left out. You can't do something with somebody with a verse if the verse isn't there. And how illogical is it for you to take the verse and stick it into a, 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 a paragraph as you translate and then turn around and say, well, there's a gap there. So what do you do? <laughs> you got a bigger gap now, and now the context's all messed up. How are you going to deal with that? I got a Phillips Godspeed Bible at home that actually goes in 1 John 5, 7. 
it, they, they take it out. In all the modern Bibles, that verse is gone. Great deity verse. 1 John 5, 6, 1 John 5, 8. Where's 7? Well, they got wise after somebody said, 7 comes after 6. Probably a 5-year-old told them that. And then what happens is, well, they get wise about it, and so now as they reconstruct these new Bibles, they just take a verse before it or a verse after it, and they split it into two verses. They can just slide it and then put the numbers so all the numbers keep working. If you mess the numbers up, can you imagine taking big chunks out of the book of John like they want to do and try to do and then try to figure out the context as you're reading along? You go, what? That doesn't make any sense. You can't take things away from the Word of God. You can't do it because it's always going to be there because this is God's Word. Romans chapter 4, Paul says this, verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by faith, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Verse 3, and then he makes this appeal. He uses this verse twice, here in Romans 4, 3. Uh, I'm sorry, here in Galatians. Uh, so when you see the verse, you look at it, and it. And Brother Rick said this. He says this is the question that answers all questions. Any question you have about the Word of God or any question you have about life itself, is answered by this question. What does the scripture say? There's great validity in that. There's great comfort in that. Especially if you come to the point where you've gotten saved and you come to the knowledge of the truth and now people are trying to take your Bible away from you. Don't let them do it. You can't do that. There are two things, the number one and number two things that you need in your life is God's Word and the Holy Spirit inside of you to teach you that Word. You need to get saved, you need to get established in the faith, and you need to get to work. That's the job. God's book in you. See? For you, in you, through you. He's going to work that way. God's book and God's people. The design for this is so simple in Romans 16, 25, and 26. Uh, Ted was covering that beautifully last night, how it shows the gospel, and, and it shows the mystery, and it shows the other scriptures. And, it, and, and then you, you look at this, and it's, it's like, that's so simple. How, how more simple could it be? And in Romans 1, Paul says it's that, it's that spiritual gift to impart unto you. You know, mutual faith between you and me, it's happening right here this week. And it happens on Facebook, it happens online, it happens on the telephone, it happens at camp, it happens everywhere. When we come together in one place and fellowship one with another, we're getting ready for glory. It's, a, it's really a first fruits taste of that future state. And if we're going to Spend eternity together, we just might as well get to know each other now. Why not? Turn to Titus chapter 1. I use this one at camp a lot with the children because they understand lying so well. They can lie like a rug. I had a little five-year-old call me a liar this year. First time in 22 years at camp. And you know why he said it? He, I said, I'm going, we're going to stop, you know, at such and such time. He got up, he looked at that clock, and it was barely past one minute past. He says, you lied to me because he wanted to go swimming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry. But I tried. Titus chapter 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is after godliness. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He not only promised it before the world began, but Paul says that he cannot lie. 
In Hebrews 6, it says it's impossible for him to lie. That's why he cannot do it. It's not within his nature. God couldn't lie if he wanted to. Later on in the book, we find out that he can't die either. This is fantastic. What kind of a God would put together a book and throw it to the wolves and just let it get chewed up? What is that? What's the point of that? There is no point in it. The fact is, there's one God and there's one Bible. Now, you have to find it. Most of you here have already done that. Some of you are maybe interested in trying to do that. But you have to approach God's word with a believing heart, not with a skeptical heart. So take all that skepticism and all that uh, you know, new thinking and chuck it out the window. These kids, uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4, these kids at camp were, you know, they, they want to <laughs> be like Stephen Hawking's and be smart. And uh, they, out of all the theoretical stuff that Stephen Hawking's has put out and Carl, what's his name? The Sagan. Sagan is billions and billions of years. Yeah, he's going to learn about billions of years. He's already probably figured that one out. But Deuteronomy chapter 4, as you go through this, uh, I said, there's nobody out there, and there are no aliens. Don't believe Star Wars movies, Star Trek movies, and all those kinds of things. Those are just rubber suits. Forget it. They don't exist. There's nothing out there. If you go out there, you'll see so much order in the universe that it's unbelievable. You'll even see some godly humor out there where the planet Uranus goes the other way. It's on its side and goes backwards. What's that all about? The fact that Halley's Comet comes around and makes a hundred-year circuit through our galaxy and never hits anything big enough to destroy it for many, many years. And it comes around like the clock, and everybody wants to see it. It's a rare thing. How does that happen? How do all these things happen? Well, it's got to be aliens. Hawking said in the end where, where he was talking about this issue, he says, I believe aliens came here and did the earth thing. He, he's, it's, their, it's their planet. I got news for you. The Son of Man denotes the idea that it's Jesus Christ's planet. Okay? He owns and has the title deed. And we're not given to save it. That is the height of ridiculous thinking. So in Hebrews chapter 4, I want you to notice something that is being reminded to the nation of Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 4. He says in verse 31, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31, And the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. Now notice verse 32, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven to the other whether there uh, hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. He's talking about the creation of man, and he's talking about the exodus, that he has brought them out of Egypt. And he, you see this, and, and he says, Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the, of the fire, and thou hast heard and live, he says, or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by mighty hand, and by stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? He says, unto thee it was shown that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Wow. You know, that doesn't sound like a guy who fumbles around and can't keep a book. Does it? No, it doesn't. So when we talk about these things, the reason I mention that, if you need an alien verse for the kids, is that that's a reason. There's a reason being preached today by the world system that takes people away from the word of God and starts getting them into the fantasy world. And that's why they don't believe it. And it doesn't matter whether they believe it real strong or they hold it weakly. But if they die without believing Christ died for their sins, they're going straight to hell. And that goes for kids, too. 
So you don't, you know, the, the, the lives and the souls of men, women, and children are at stake in this. So if you're going to preach or you're going to be a, 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 a Christian that goes out and does the work of the ministry, and you should be, you have to have a book. You have to have the sword of the Spirit and have the understanding of how to use it. And it's not complicated. It's the most efficient way you can ever study this book is to start with the person who wrote the book and believe that. Believe that fact, okay? And there are some facts. Uh, I want to start here. I want to look at some internal evidence. I've had people say to me, well, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. That's circular logic. You can't do it. It's, it's not even a precedent. You can't take the Bible and use what it says to, pr to prove itself. I said, watch me. It's going to work. <laughs> and the other thing I can tell you about the proof is that God's creation around you and the conscience of God in you is enough to send you to the lake of fire and never even consider opening this book. Thou art inexcusable, O man. So don't think that you're going to get away just because you don't uh, subscribe to some detail about the Bible making claims about itself. Where else would he put it in written form? In the meantime, before the Bible was written, he did it verbally, directly. He just doesn't do that anymore at least not today in the dispensation of grace. If God's speaking to you in audible terms and audible voices, you need to go see a doctor. <laughs> Seriously. Just don't do it. I had a young man and a man come to my shop one time, and they would come up in an old beat-up station wagon, and they were looking for something. And, and uh, He said, are you the preacher around here? I said, uh, I'm working today, but... <laughs> I want to talk to this guy. You know, I was pretty young, and he said, uh, I, I, I want to talk to you about some things. I said, okay, so we got at it. You know, Here we go. I'm outside. I'm working. I got to put down a belt sander and hammer and all these other things. I got my overalls on. I'm working. And he says uh, this and this and this, and he starts going in. He's a charismaniac. <laughs> and I said, I've never talked to one of these in real life before, just a couple <laughs> times. And I showed him some verses about Asking him for his coat, and he's supposed to give it to me. I said, I want that car right there. <laughs> this kid that was next to him, he goes, how are we going to get home? <laughs> That's what the first thing he said. He thought he was going to give it to him, because I'm showing him the verses. And the kid is believing the Bible. So I went over, and I got a, I got a cup, and I put some toluene in it. You know what that is, like a solvent. And I, I, that, that's a, a very harsh solvent. It's like lacquer thinner, only like 10 times worse. I just use it to clean for my off the cabinets, and pour some in the cup. I said, here, take a drink of that. Let's go to the verse. I went and took him to Mark 16, 16. And he said, oh, you're tempting God now. I said, no, you're not believing the word on the page. That's the problem. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, we went around and around for a little while, and I gave him the gospel, and I talked to him about how to get saved. And I walked away from that a little discouraged because I, I thought, man, I ought to be able to convince this guy. Don't ever try to convince anybody of anything. Just let the book do it. Amen. You don't have to defend it. Amen. Just like a lion in a cage, just let him out. He'll defend himself. No problem. <laughs> but you have to speak it. You have to teach it. There, is some, there are some really interesting things that happen when people hear the words of God. They actually... It, it actually connects with their conscience. And they get convicted. And they want to know. If you'll take a group of kids out into the woods or take them out into the mountains or take them out in the Gulf of Mexico, whatever, and you get them out there and you, you show them the natural world, they really want to get closer to this. They really like seeing this because behind every great design, there's a great designer, right? And we have one. And he wrote a book. And he wrote one book. Not a bunch of them. Let's take a look at what Paul says. Paul's our apostle. And he magnifies his office. So we'll start there. All of Paul's epistles begin with his name, Paul. There's your sign right there. Thirteen letters with thirteen signatures. The first word, Paul. Okay? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I know this is simple, basic information, but it is useful. First Thessalonians 
chapter 3. I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I always get those mixed up. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. There you go. There's your token sign. You want to find Paul's epistles? Romans to Philemon. Now, Paul teaches that what he spoke while he was preaching as the word of God to the Thessalonians, turn back to chapter uh, turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says that those things that he was preaching while he was there and out preaching and doing the work of the ministry was received as the word of God before it was ever committed to paper, as far as we know. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks to 13. Second Thessalonians, or uh, 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 2.13. He says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because... When ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in ye belief. Oh, there's another piece of evidence other than just the conscience and the creation, how it works and changes the lives of people. So when you see the word of God working in somebody, there's evidence of it. When you see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in little David when he takes a rock, and goes after Goliath, he didn't go after Goliath. He went after five giants. That's why he got five smooth stones. He just, did, he just had a slow day. That's all that happened. He was the only giant on the hill at that time. When he picks up those five smooth stones, he just puts one of them in Goliath's forehead. But before that, he killed the bear. Before that, he killed the lion. And he proved that that armor of King Saul wasn't going to help him one bit. Because God was in him, working. Hey, yeah, yeah that's powerful. And uh, that day, old Goliath got a piece of the rock, didn't he? From a, from a stripling. The, man, the boy I was telling you about a while ago, Adriel, he's a stripling. About that tall, skinny, 13, cute kid. Stripling. That's what David was. He was not a, he was not a muscle-bound 20-year-old out there doing this, God uses a little stripling with a little rock like that big. You know who killed that giant? God killed him using his servant. And so when you see the word working mightily in people like Samson and David and, and Joshua and people like that, it's just fantastic. And you say, well, something's going on there. And so when you meet a person and you think, oh, this person might be a Christian, they don't have a cross around their neck. You ever seen people trying to identify themselves that way? You know, they put a cross around their neck when they're openly atheist. <laughs> Rock stars do it all the time, you know. It's the thing to do, you know. I'm a Christian. Well, if you believe the Word of God before it's even written down, because the Apostle Paul said it, that means you believe God's Word coming through Paul. You know, this whole book's already been written down in heaven. It's all there. So in the Bible, when it says the scripture, sometimes it mentions it before the scripture that you're reading about was ever written. So they're synonymous, right? Turn over to Revelation chapter 19, and you can see this, this is the most daunting, <laughs> scary, beautiful passage about the Lord Jesus Christ the living word coming back in the form of who he is now as the man Christ Jesus, and he is the written word as well. Now, he's not the book. You can take this Bible and throw it in the trash and go buy another one. It's, that's, not, that's not the word of God. That love letter I was talking about a while ago, uh, I have some letters from, in my family from p different people over the years that I've read. I just got to found another batch of them, and I'm reading through them, and I'm just, this is amazing. And the things that my wife writes to me over the years and stuff, it's not the paper they're on and the ink that she used. It's the sentiment, isn't it, that you're saving. That's what the living word is. It's what's being said, and by the person that you know is saying it, that's how it lives in you. It is the living word. 
And that's been really, that's really been great. Hearing about this, uh, you know, yesterday was fantastic. And here's what he says in verse 12. He says, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. They're going to come face to face with the living word after rejecting for many generations the written word. And when they do it, these are people that have never prayed to God or only prayed to false gods, and now they're going to pray to rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. They don't want to meet him. They're not only every eye is going to behold him, they're all going to see him face to face. It's going to be brutal. And it's not brutal because God's brutal. It's brutal because they've been stupid and they've brought it upon themselves. They are in the wrong place at the wrong time for sure. But it doesn't matter what time in history you live. If you die without Christ, you're dead. You're going down. You go straight to the lake of fire. You fall right into the pit. Now, Paul goes on to say that... What he receives, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He receives information from the Lord directly by direct revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I think this is a, a great passage because people like to talk about being spiritual. And their child is, this, this is my spiritual one. Now, what does that mean? Is he saved? I, I don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean going to heaven. That's what I mean. Do you have eternal life? See, this spiritual thing starts with the cross around the neck and then it goes on to other things. But I can tell you, if any man, verse 37, think himself to be a prophet or spiritual... 1437, if any man thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be. Just let him be ignorant. You can't, you can't deal with people like that other than the fact that you can try again some other time. But men, men make up their own minds because they've got a free will. These revelations, like he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, This I say unto you by the word of the Lord. And uh, turn one more. Go over to the book of Galatians, uh, just a couple books over, one book over here, and just look at this. This is beautiful. Uh, when I was learning a little bit about this issue, I, I really appreciated this. Um, Paul says, we were talking about this at breakfast, verse 10. He says, for, for, I, for, do, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So be careful what you do with this Bible, because there's a relationship being built between you and him that is based upon you trusting him and, and trusting that he would never, ever lie to you. You know what happens if, if we could prove that God was a liar from the Bible? We'd all have to just chuck the Bible and forget it. But it's not there. People like to say it's there, but it doesn't exist. God says, he's not like a man that he should lie. Paul says, yea, let God be true, and every man a liar. Amen. And all liars are going to the lake of fire. So here he goes on, he says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. And he means by man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I will come to visions and revelations. So when you begin to understand some of these things, you want to get a little deeper into it. And so how do we get the prophet out of the Bible? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, or chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Compare these with, the, with somebody sometimes. Lock these two verses together. <clears throat> Paul had the scripture. Timothy had the scripture. It was already working. It was already there for him to have. If Paul tells you to rightly divide the word of truth and he tells that to Timothy, then what would Timothy divide the word? How would he do that? How could he rightly divide the word, divide this truth from that truth, if he didn't have all the other books? 
If I tell you to rightly divide the Old Testament from the New Testament, and you don't have the Old Testament, you say, what are you talking about? See, you have to have it all before you can rightly divide it. That's assumed. He also says in 2 Timothy, he says, rightly dividing the word of truth, God would never tell you to do that if you didn't actually have the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, perfected unto service. And uh, Brother Ted showed the content last night. It was beautiful how, how Paul's epistles are laid out in, in a certain order, just like the Bible is laid out in a certain order. And so you begin to look at this and, and, wow, there's a lot of thinking going on here. And it's not me. I'm just trying to figure it out. God's the one that lays it out for me. And people are striving and they're doing all these things. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 while we're here. And I want you to notice that when Paul talks about this in context, if you have a, a blank page in your Bible between the Old Testament and New Testament, you've got a commentary there. That, that blank page, it says New Testament and nothing else. Or maybe it just might be a blank page. That's a commentary that there's a divider between Old Testament and New Testament, and that's a lie. There is no division between Malachi and the book of Matthew. Okay? That's a lie. If you've got red letters in your Bible, that's a lie. That's a commentary. That's, that is you seeing a very mild form of corruption. That's you seeing somebody messing with the color of a word and trying to shift your attention over to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the historical books that are to Israel, and those books in a different group, a different dispensation, to, to take you away from what? These words over here. Well, Paul says, look, he talks about this in Second, uh, 1 Timothy 6. He says, if any man teach otherwise, talking about the doctrines of grace and the, the, the revelation given to him, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words... Aren't all the words of the Bible wholesome? Yes. The form of sound words. Aren't they all sound? Yes. But only the ones written directly to you and about you can be that way for you because if you don't write it, divide them, you're going to find yourself trying to drink toluene, okay? I met a guy one time uh, that, that drank Drano as a charismaniac. Him and his wife both drank it. His name was Saul. And I went and met Saul. Alan Reagan took me to meet him, and I went and talked to him, and he couldn't talk. He was talking like that. And I sat down with the Bible and tried to show him that uh, there's a reason why that verse exists in Mark 16, and that he shouldn't have tried to do that. <laughs> Don't do that again, Saul. He couldn't do anything but be a night guard at the, at the Lutheran church. That's all he could do. He didn't have to say anything. And he still wouldn't come off that position. He said, I didn't believe God. That's right, you didn't. You didn't believe that verse. And that verse wasn't written to you. People, it doesn't dawn on people that sometimes when they go into Matthew, Matthew Mark, Luke, and John and start reading the words of Jesus in red, that they come across things that, that just basically, it's like, hey, Jesus wasn't talking to you. Have you ever had anybody say to you, excuse me, don't interrupt me. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to this person. That's rude, isn't it, when you interrupt? It's hard. But, you know, here Paul says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, but doting, he says, you go down uh, in verse 3, go up in verse 3, he says, these wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, Whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings. They don't want to know the wholesome words. They don't want to know the form of sound words. All they want to do is strive about words. And now you see that Paul is saying that the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are what? Is there a fire going on here? Oh, it just reset. Okay. 45 more minutes. All right, here we go. <laughs> he says, He is proud knowing nothing but doting. You see, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the context of the 13 epistles of Paul. So the, the epistles of Paul are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to us through Paul. And Paul takes you all the way back 
past from the foundation of the world into before the foundation of the world in his context. And he also takes you all the way out into the ages to come. So as you look at this and you understand the words of the Lord Jesus Christ here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ given to him. He's not referring back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in those words of Jesus in red. He's talking about the words that came out of Jesus' mouth after he ascended as resurrected in glory. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we should hang on to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to close with this one. Um, Look at Matthew chapter 22. And there's so many of these. Uh, I'll put these sheets out on the table if you'd like to pick one up and, uh, and have some of the verses to go home and look at. Matthew 22, 31. Uh, this, was, this was really a great verse. When I, when I first saw this verse for the first time, uh, I, I just had, I just, it was just sending chills down my spine. I thought, you know, this is great. This is great. We're actually seeing the mechanics of how God treats and deals with his own Bible. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Verse 29, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? He's talking to them about the copies that they now possess at this particular time in the first century and they are in possession of the scriptures. And he says and calls them the scriptures. He does the same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch over in Acts 8. He was reading from the scriptures. Now, did that, did that eunuch pass by Nazareth and go into that synagogue and steal that scroll and have it out there in the desert when Philip walks up to him? No, there's copies everywhere. And he says that that copy is the word of God. The copy. Where were the Ten Commandments after they were broken? In the trash. They got a new set made. God made them a new set. And that was the set that was put in the Ark of the Covenant. Not the broken crumbs. You know, that, there's a great lesson here. He says, that which is written unto you. Have ye not uh, read that which was spoken unto you, excuse me, by God saying, I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. You know why they were astonished at his doctrine? Because they had never heard this before. He did not speak like the scribes spoke. He spoke with authority, it says. They had no idea where the word of God was. And they didn't care. And when he walks up to them and begins to talk to them, they just called him names. And they're going to live with that for a long time. You know, forever is a long time to be wrong, isn't it? I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I got a book. And I'm glad I know a group of people that got one as well. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your word. And we thank you for all that we have in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the word of God that can effectually work in us that believe it and trust it and that we should not correct it or speak evil of it or condemn it in any way. We thank you, Lord, for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.